Hello, everyone. I'm Joe Weinman, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, either live or on YouTube at some point in the future. Um, so we have an amazing, really amazing set of panelists today uh, to discuss what's going on with EDGE and how it relates to some evolving issues, whether it ranges from smart cities or um, uh, potential internet of military things. And so without further ado, because uh, we actually don't have a lot of time to cover so much material, I'm going to introduce the panelists or let them introduce themselves. Um, and at the end, we will uh, hopefully have some time for Q&A. So uh, please, John, if you would start things off. Sure, thanks, Joe. Uh, I am John Cowan. I am the co-founder and CEO of EdgeX. Jeff Deco, I'm chairman of the Autonomy Institute. Good morning. I'm Mike Helfrich, founder and CEO at Blue Force Development Corporation, uh, based on Boston's North Shore. Pleased to be here. Hey, good morning. I'm Matthew Ratnasar. I'm the Vice President of Product Management and Product Solutions for Cubic Corporation's MC2 division. So let's start, because I don't know who all is on this call, with a very simple question, which is, what in the world is the edge? So I think I think Joe I think the edge is uh, is something different depending on who you speak to and um, you know if you're talking to a telco like a like a, a mobile network operator they'll talk about their cell towers if you uh, talk to data center operators they'll talk about their portfolio of data center real estate if you talk to the cloud companies they'll talk about their availability zones and their their uh, their compute that they're pushing out to customer environments. Um, so you get a different answer depending on who you speak to. From our perspective at EdgeX, the edge is high performance computers located everywhere within a thousand feet of a connected uh, intelligent sensor device or machine. Um, it's everywhere and anywhere that a computer is required to process data and deliver uh, intelligence at low latency. So if it's farther than a thousand feet away, it's not the edge. It's not less. It's it's give or take. Okay, we're not uh, we're not. Okay, uh, at one thousand and one feet. It, it's okay. But All right. You know, Everyone I, agree you know, with that, or does anyone have any uh, color to add to that? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I I think John's correct that you know you only have different definitions for different market segments, right? And the military, uh, they I think they also often get confused where they think the edges the last forward operating base in, in battle space, right? Uh, or the last vehicle. We tend to think of the edge almost down to the, the body worn uh, scenario where, you know, on the soldier or on the first responder in a city. And I don't think edge is necessarily a, a new term. You know, we think of uh, IoT and, and fog computing, right? Mm -hmm. It's always been a concept that's been around for probably, a, you know, well over a decade. I think it's only now that we can realize the edge because of high performance compute and we can put in a small form factor and the additional bandwidth we can leverage from the many different mediums such as 5G, you know, Wi-Fi 6 and whatnot. Right. Well, when we had cloud, we ended up with cloud washing. And now that there's edge, there's edge washing. So <laughs> um, it just is uh, good to get a, a sense of what you all mean by it, because uh, some people, you know, to John's point, if I have a uh, second global data center, that means it's the edge. Joe, we have some ideas on that too, and it kind of goes back to the um, the 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 original question around edge. What is the edge? I mean, and, and this is why we were so excited to work with with EdgeX and and Cubic, is that we we kind of view at least our customers view the edge as where the action actually happens, where something has to be executed against a threat or against an opportunity. So when we think about the edge as well, you know, uh, echoing what uh, what Matt and John had said, um, we really think the edge edge compute um, is really optimized for time constrained decision environments where uh, an activity or an event that happens in the in the battle space or in the smart city the value of that event has a shelf life measured in minutes right and and the cloud isn't necessarily built for that and especially when we start to think about some of the benefits we're going to get from the edgex environment and and what jeffrey's doing uh, at the autonomy institute it's really going to be about high speed compute at the edge where the decision uh, a capability is literally measured in minutes and where we can push things like artificial intelligence cognitive services uh, uh, multivariant threat detection down to the edge and get that millisecond detection and also be able to leverage it for queuing of other IoT sensors and other orchestration devices. So, all right, let's assume that uh, that definition is good. Um, next question is uh, kind of what is it good for? What are the use cases or scenarios where 
I need the edge versus I can do fine with my own data center or the cloud or even a, a loosely distributed cloud. We, we looked at what um, uh, John and team are doing specific to uh, distributed compute and just this high efficiency of, of handoff of network, but also operating system, and then sitting on top of uh, uh, the pin uh, with Mr. Ducos involved in an autonomy. And of course, uh, with Matt the pin is, being... Yeah, public infrastructure network node. So it's, it's basically and, and, and what does that mean? Yeah. If I can interrupt my interruption too. Well, it, it, the, the best way we, we try to frame it is if we think about we went from broadcast um, antennas down to cell towers, and now we're going from cell towers down to small cell. Um, but um, in the case of the small cell at the location of a, a, a intersection, it's going to have many other components. It's not just going to be wireless. It's also going to be advanced sensors, IoT, and compute. Um, so is a way to think of it just basically kind of something like a street light that's on the corner within John's thousand foot range that has wireless connectivity and compute and storage and network resources? So, so what, say so Joe, one of the reasons why I use the thousand foot kind of analogy to kind of put that in your mind's right. eye for a moment is because the nature of applications as we look forward over the next 20 years of the internet are going to be um, highly mobile and highly ephemeral in nature, yeah. which is very different than applications in the last 20 years of the internet, where we wrote applications to a specific computer or a specific availability zone. Mm -hmm. Applications, code and data and content, they need to look, be located everywhere so that as the devices and things which are not tethered to mm -hmm. land or machines or what have you, they're highly mobile devices that are out there in the yeah. field. As they roam around and need to be able to execute code or consume data, they're doing so across a fabric of computers, which is what distributed computing is. They're doing, they're doing something across the fabric of computers that are interconnected, right? And behaving so, as, as uh, a, a, um, a, a single insertion point for code and data. So um, maybe I can drill down a little bit on that and ask you, um, so I get it, fabric of computing that's highly distributed, um, uh, highly proximate, um, but what are some examples that my mom would understand um, as to how I actually would use this. Like, mm -hmm. and, and to be also maybe not my mom, but someone from a traditional legacy cloud provider, um, what, wouldn't they just say, well, you know, you can really run things just fine out of my cloud. Um, you know, a uh, few tens of milliseconds isn't gonna make a difference. What's an example of a real world application where such short time frames are so essential? Well, I, I don't want to bring your mom into it, but you did. So okay. here's, here, here, here's a great example of, of how all of this benefits your mom as she continues to want to drive her car as she ages. Okay. She, you know, she's going to benefit from riding around in a, in a vehicle that is, that's intelligence is highly augmented by the consumption and processing of data in and around her as she goes to pick up her groceries or comes to see her favorite son. Okay. What about, uh, Anything around like crime uh, detection or national security, homeland security? Anyone have any examples, or is it just my mom and when she goes to get groceries? <laughs> well, it could be your mom, you know, walking down a dark alley in the middle of the night. So uh, Matt, <laughs> okay. Matt, 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 and Mike can walk us through some of those examples. Sure. Matt, you want or to if my mom or? is out on a battlefield would be another scenario. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and I, I think this is where, where Mike can really expound upon, but I think it's the fusion of data um, at the localized area um, to make a, a quick decision, right? When there's an accident, I, I, I was driving to North Raleigh the other day, uh, yesterday, last night, and the road was out, right? Um, no way could I have known that 10 minutes prior, but the only road I got on, there was no other detour that was a short you know, leg. I had to take almost 45 minutes out of the way just to pass a bridge that was out. And, and that type of data can happen in real time. Now it does today, right? But it goes back to a server and that goes over whatever applications are there. But in real time, if I can hit, my car could have known that, it could have displayed it on a navigation and said, you know, bypass here, turn left or right, right away. Um, in, in real time, right? Not when I actually hit that barrier um, when I was 10 minutes late to drop my son off. Um, I think also natural disasters or, or crisis situations, right? We look at you know, active shooter instances in, in a town, right? If we can localize uh, where that gunshot came from, from four or five different sensors, we can figure out what direction it was firing to or from, uh, where it's located, and then uh, 
push people in a way that gets them away from the threat, but then also allows our first responders to respond to that same area mm -hmm. and know how to assemble on the threat rather than just diving right in the front door and, and, and proposing or getting themselves into uh, further danger. So there's a lot of decision making that can happen in seconds. What I'm imagining is that it's not just a latency issue, but that there are also some, or latency per se, but um, sort of a latency and bandwidth type of trade-off um, where without sufficient bandwidth, that will introduce latency besides propagation delay. Um, so I would imagine as the world moves to more video sensors um, and you have like uh, smart and safe cities that are collecting all that video data, that simply the backhaul network bottleneck becomes virtually impossible to traverse in any kind of meaningful time frame, because you know as we move from you know HD to uh, 4K to 8K to 16K to half dome to full dome to 3D to 120 or 240 frames per second, um, I would imagine that that's just a lot of data. Given that you know the deployment of those devices and the uh, bandwidth being generated by those devices is uh, just overwhelming. You know even though telcos and uh, network providers are putting in massive upgrades to bandwidth. It just, you know, even at 20% or 30% or 40% per year, I would imagine you can't keep up. So is that a driver well, also I, for I, edge apps? Yeah, I think, hey, hey, Joe, I think, look, 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 let's pretend for a second that you could solve the physics problem of proximity of high performance computers. And there was enough bandwidth on the surface of the earth to actually, you know, send all this data uh, from where it's generated. Um, you know, I think you, ha you, ha you can't have this conversation without discussing cost. I mean, moving that volume of data across tariff networks makes a lot of these solutions untenable. Yep. Yeah, especially yeah, so when it's cost in time and yeah. cost in dollars. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jeff, you look like you were going to jump in. Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say that like a, a single pin um, with the sensors that uh, really you know, provide that resilience um, in, in the visual acuity of what's actually happening at an intersection to make sure that pedestrians stay safe, that the rover and the cars and the shuttles all interact with each other is, is well over a petabyte per month. Um, and from an economic standpoint, if you're trying to push a petabyte per pin, 1500 pins in a city back to a cloud, um, it means it's not going to happen because nobody has the pocketbook to pay for it. So you actually have to process data at the edge. You have to keep it sovereign on the edge. And even things like um, resilience um, um, in the system, because like things like microgrids require a decision and made in, in five milliseconds or less. Mm -hmm. That means um, it's untenable um, to, to be connected to, to the cloud to make that decision. Right. The, you mentioned resilience. I would think that, you know, some, I have a hard enough time just, you know, getting basic email over my internet provider, who I won't mention by name, um, but it starts with an O and ends with a Ptimim. Um, but uh, but uh, so, yeah, if we're talking about mission critical or safety critical applications, then that type of, you know, mesh resilience that the edge gives you versus, yep. you know, even dual diverse routing is uh, yep. potentially unreliable in the period of, of natural disaster. So um, to get back to kind of some of these different applications, um, you know, there's, a, you know, public safety, public health, um, you know, I would imagine being able to do proximity for someone that has COVID, you know, and basically say, don't walk on this side of the sidewalk. Um, but uh, what about from a natural disaster, uh, homeland security, national security, you know, and military applications, which is obviously a, a branch of national security. Um, would any of you care to jump in and explain kind of like how that will potentially unfold and what might be in store for us? Yeah, I'd be happy to give you a couple of use cases if you'd like. Um, sure. You know, as, as, as uh, all the folks were speaking, the two of them really came to mind on the national security side. Um, uh, we supported um, joint counterterrorism task forces on the southern and northern border for about nine years. Um, and this is back in the 3G and then 4G world. Um, and I'll give you a couple examples. Um, one of the big challenges was silos of IoT, right? Um, you know, different sensors with different backhauls, with different um, uh, data formats, things like that. Um, one of the things that we did early on with Edge Compute was actually move the compute and move the comms within a mile or two miles of the border where we intensively enforce 30 miles of border, looking for uh, different types of trafficking, looking for narcotics, looking for WMD. 
And, you know, back in those days, we could have a seismic sensor that might go off and we might have a magnetometer that would go off. But the problem was we couldn't get those two to cue each other or to fuse with each other to really make sense. And they would scramble a quick reaction for us. And it was a jackrabbit, right? Because the seismic went off. So the real the real key with the a high very large speed, jackrabbit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Precisely. And they get pretty big and partic- on the northern border. I'm sure it was gigantic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, New Mexico has their share of good ones, too. But <laughs> but, the, but the neat thing about pushing compute and I think pushing the um, the, the, the high um, uh, throughput of communications um, to the edge was we could cue a seismic sensor and compare it with a magnetometer from a different manufacturer in single millisecond. Uh, to really say uh, jackrabbits don't carry metal. So we could really get a higher level of precision. And then the other thing that the low latency at the edge is going to give us is the ability then to cue something like a ground radar. Um, How many tracks are they coming at me? Are they going perpendicular to me? Mm -hmm. And then the ability, and I think John touched on this, to cue a millimeter wave infrared uh, camera, which back in those days, we actually had to put a warfighter in the middle of the desert with that camera. And now with some of this, this high speed compute, plus the low latency, plus to Jeffrey's point, the ability to kind of do calculations at the edge, yeah. um, we believe you're going to be able to minim- you're going to o- almost eliminate false positives and really only alert a decision maker when something has been made sense of. And we think that's some of the power of edge compute and also the, the comms that uh, everyone's doing so, here. So all, all of those use cases are fan- perfect examples of everything that we've been doing and we've been building as an industry. But the next step, the next layer in this evolution is to take all of that goodness and awareness and analytics and actually turn it into intelligence. And in order to do that, you have to federate or distribute learning. We have to take things like AI models and be able to push them to the edge. Because you're sucking all this data back to a machine learning platform yep. in a centralized cloud doesn't solve the problem. We can look at data and do all kinds of post-mortem analysis on things and we can create intelligence and we can, we can uh, fuel machine learning um, uh, databases and what have you, but it's not in real time, right? So pushing the, or what we call federating those learning models down to the edge, that you can't do this on Raspberry Pis. You must do this on high performance mm-hmm. computers located in close proximity to where the data is originating yeah. if you want that real time effect. Jeff, cool. were you going to jump in? I was going to say, I completely agree. I mean, I think, you know, we're, people are surprised when we say that we're um, focused on getting 10 kilowatts of compute um, at these nodes because they think, well, what would you do with 10 um, kilowatts of compute? And you quickly go down the list and you're, you're actually exceeding. Um, the use of 10 kilowatts at the edge and things like putting, you know, GPUs um, for that edge learning is really vital because once again, you can't move the data gravity does not allow you to suck that all up to a cloud and things like FPGAs are really going to have a, their, their place in, in the, the, the stars or, or the, the, the limelight because um, it also allows you to upgrade over time um, and, and uh, change those learning algorithms um, very quickly without having to change out necessarily hardware all the time. And so, um, side, sorry, sorry. yeah, go ahead, Matt. Matt uh, yeah. I, I think the military side, it, it creates some interesting challenges, right? Because we're also very power constrained in those environments. Mm-hmm. But one of the examples I can see um, is some predictive analysis and uh, identification at, at the edge, right? So, as from a biometric data perspective, mm-hmm. Uh, when we collected biometric data, you know, in Afghanistan and Iraq, it often involved the, the warfighter to go back to the FOB that night after a long patrol, upload that data, get a refresh of that information and make a positive identification for somebody that may be in the field. You know, now with our, some of our communication networks that we have, we can almost do that in real time, especially when we start to look at, you know, expanding a wireless communication or man A out to the edge. But also it's like looking at those video sensors, right, for predictive analysis on what somebody's doing um, traditionally, we have to push that all the way up into the cloud to say, is that that person squatting down below a level and possibly putting in an IED, right? Now, at the local level, we can put those algorithms on a GPU or a small compute. So as we're overwatching a, a target or a road intersection that's a, a possible enemy target, we can start to see that, hey, there's behaviors that are going on that we need, maybe need to react to before it actually happens. Yeah, I would imagine... Um trying to do anything, whether it's uh, detecting uh, who fired a gun, um, like in a big city, or if it's, you know, somewhere uh, abroad during war fighting, that um, that kind of overnight answer as to what happened yesterday yeah. or a week ago is probably not super helpful unless uh, 
the uh, the enemy or the criminal is kind enough to kind of you know say hey I'm here and I'm not going to move for a week or so so you can come get me at your own leisure but I go on vacation next Thursday so you got to come we'll, uh, we'll engage when you get your data package back yeah. <laughs> right right exactly it's okay completely understand yeah so I think, um, I think that's why Joe I think that's you know it doesn't surprise us that we ended up finding um, collaborators you know with Cubic in the DoD space because. A lot of these, a lot of these needs are they really truly are life and death. And so it really drives the front end of innovation, right? I mean, you know, it, it's um, you know, these these use cases, these examples in the internet of military things, um, are they're not like, you know, hyperbole or like, you know, wishful thinking of the next 20 years about flying cars. This is real, real life stuff, life and death stuff. And so um, it just it to, to us it makes sense that you know, that um, the Internet of Military Things forms uh, ahead of a lot of other um, ideas, you know, around this space. Well, you know, I could argue that beyond military applications, all of these things are a matter of life and death, right? Mm -hmm. So if I think about um, like, you know, COVID exposure tracing, um, mm -hmm. you know, that could be a matter of life or death for someone. If I think about, uh, you know, uh, crime in the city where someone is acting suspiciously, maybe planning a bomb, maybe they're just a pickpocket or you know, some other type of personal right. assault, um, you know, that's life and death, uh, you know, vision zero and uh, vehicle collision mm -hmm. detection is life and death, right? So um, yes. finding a parking space can sometimes be a matter of life and death, or it seems that way. <laughs> so, um, so all these things, basically having information to close the uh, OODA loop quickly is, uh, yes. is critical. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good PSA uh, ahead of Black Friday. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Well, you know, but what's interesting is we have lived through sort of this era of um, e-commerce and Facebook being like the major use cases for the internet, right? And as we move to the internet of things or the internet of military things, you know, it may seem like life or death if you don't get that last sweater for your loved one. Um, but, you know, to your point, um, these are, are really critical applications. They're not, right. you know, and we could go beyond that. How about sensors and factories, right? Where, you know, there's a sensor that shows a, you know, a toxic leak um, or, uh, you know, a, a fire that started or what have you. So, you know, many of these different applications really are critically important. All this data collection, um, how does that play into, first of all, privacy? Right. So who ensures that my data about my, you know, movements in front of my house are, you know, are safe um, and also security, uh, because I'm sure I don't need to tell anyone on this call. We've had a lot of an increasing set of crazy incidents happening lately. Right. You've got uh, Colonial Pipeline um, and some of the crazy things with people lining their uh, pickup truck with plastic bags and trying to fill the back of the pickup truck with gasoline. I don't know if you saw that. That was pretty crazy. Wow. Uh, you've got JBL meatpacking. You've got different ransomware attacks on hospitals. Um, so with all of that going on, especially uh, some of you may know there was a, a steel mill in Germany um, that was taken down and actually destroyed because they, they got into some of the uh, control systems and literally they were able to, you know, just make the plant turn on itself and melt itself down. Um, you've got the great American Northeast blackout, which seems like it was yesterday, you know, or I think, are we going to be- I think if we take, hey Joe, I think if we take the approach of the practices, the cybersecurity practices of the third internet, which is what we live in today and try and cut and paste that into the uh, internet of things, this, this era of connected machines on the internet, I think we're in for a world of hurt. Uh, because it's not, there's no cybersecurity budget on the planet that is going to prevent um, the kinds of attacks and the kinds of breaches that we're just used to seeing and reading about on a daily basis on the internet. Um, and that's, that's simply because the architecture of the way that we do things today is highly centralized. Mm -hmm. So I, I, what I like to say in describing the problem um, from an architectural problem is that if I have anything of value and I store it in a centralized location, it is a mathematical certainty that it will be stolen, breached, compromised in some way. And so if I have a uh, thousand gold bricks, do I want to put those thousand gold bricks in a single safe? Or is it mathematically uh, uh, better for me to take those thousand gold bricks and put one brick in a thousand safes? 
and, and ensure that for anybody who wanted to steal those or compromise those gold bricks, that they would have to hack or breach a thousand individual safes with all with their own, their own combinations. The probability is reduced greatly when you decentralize infrastructure, which is more of a fundamental architectural challenge than just sort of, you know, this isn't about firewalls and passwords and, and you know, uh, you know, in encrypting data at rest and these kinds of things. It's much bigger than that. It's fundamental to the architecture of the internet that has, that has to be discussed. A layered approach too. I think a lot of things you brought up were OT systems, right? That traditionally didn't have a lot of uh, cyber security protections. Um, things like cross-domain solutions, one-way diodes, and the, how you route that information going both in to make you know command decisions and how you route the return information out is, is important, right? Um, mm -hmm. So it's not just about the software and the filtering. It's also about how you handle that data and the paths that go in. So it makes, doesn't make it an easy target for a customer to just or a, a hacker to come in from a one direction, you know, front door knock in, uh, do their damage, and then come out the same door. So yep, hundred percent. So if I and go so, back over the last like ten minutes or so of uh, dialogue, um, one of the things that was brought up is the idea that it isn't just about as simple as infrastructure, uh, right? It's not just that you have to put some storage and compute. There's a, a lot of thorny problems that you have to solve around. For example, Jeff, you mentioned, um, you know, how do I get enough power to that location to mm -hmm. be able to run all this compute? Um, you know, other things that were mentioned, um, you know, how do I move a lot of advanced AI processing through, you know, GPUs or neuromorphic chips or whatever? Um, another thing is this notion, Mike, you had mentioned um, just the issues around um, how do I integrate, say, a magnetic sensor with a seismic sensor when there's different stacks? Mm -hmm. And now we just talked about security um, and, you know, the fact that there's an inherent resilience in a distributed architecture because there's no single point of failure. Um, but that said, um, you know, there are other benefits as well to chopping things up, um, you know, in terms of resilience. Well, I'd, I'd also like to highlight the, the, the zero trust um, architectures are, are things that that do exist. And I think um, distributed computing is going to uh, make that happen at, at scale. Um, but when you talk about the data gravity um, that um, you know, John often highlights, um, the data um, being at the edge really addresses the privacy concerns too, because you're able to have each city or each municipality or even a homeowners association um, can, can basically set bounds of what and where that sensor data can go. So the fact that it's actually being housed, stored and managed at the edge means that it's not in some gigantic cloud, um, basically allowing somebody to later manipulate it um, to, to their own benefit. Got it. So that adds yet another dimension is yeah. how do I figure out ways to partition the data and uh, have access yeah. only to trusted parties. When you put all of that together, it sounds really complicated. <laughs> it's not like, uh, you know, just uh, the the good old days back when I was but a lad <laughs> of uh, getting the, uh, oh, no. the paper Here cards into the card no, reader and uh, <laughs> running them on the mainframe. So yeah. how do I how do I actually make this stuff that sounds very daunting uh, reality? Like, you know, what's going on in the industry? What are you guys doing? How does it how, how do you go from sort of a, an interesting yet fun uh, webinar to, um, to reality? You do that by doing it. So this is the thing. So to, to your question, Joe, like, you know, I, I, wish we were, I wish we were just making Snickers bars. That would be easy. Or, you know, you know designing <laughs> uh, virtual cows to feed virtual uh, grass to on Facebook or something. It's just, you know, this is a highly complex problem with multiple layers to it. And that you know the approach that we took at EdgeX is to say you know what this is gonna this isn't a one company thing this isn't a one uh, developer thing this is gonna take um, a coalition it's gonna take collaboration and it's going to and it's going to take just putting it out there and and doing this kind of stuff testing um, you know computer scientists the optimal word is scientist what does a scientist do right um, we 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 have a hypothesis we test okay we learn we retest. And we refine, and that's that's really what the Internet of Military Things is all about. There's no magic switch that gets us to the future of autonomous things and intelligent 
uh, communities and, and intelligent war fighting. All of this has to be developed, but that's the exciting part from where we sit, like building this all at, at the yep. ground floor with partners like Cubic and Autonomy Institute and Blue Force and others. And it's, this is an open invitation. Anybody yep. that's listening, if you want to come be a part of the future, yep. come join us because we're, we're taking a very open approach to this. We're building these labs like at Camp Mabry and in other locations that will be forthcoming with a view to research and development, with a view to helping to solve these very complicated so, problems sorry, and challenges. What, what, is, what is Camp Mabry? <laughs> well, yeah, so yeah, so we, um, um, the Autonomy Institute established a, uh, a relationship with uh, te Texas Military Department, Camp Mabry. It's a state uh, a base. So the Texas Military Department is a state, it's, it's the National Guard and their entire focus, the 25,000 strong, is basically help the nation with uh, disaster response and emergency management. So uh, their duty is, is civilian in nature, and it's making sure that our cities, our states, and um, uh, are in the, the bounds inside the United States, CONUS stays safe and um, resilient. And um, what we, uh, um, we started working with them back in 2017 because they saw the value in um, intelligent and automated systems. And they also um, highlighted the need to have more resilient infrastructure. So if a hurricane does occur, there is systems at the edge that are at least providing situational awareness or things like assured position navigation and timing or just basic um, communication networks so they can actually go in and rescue and um, you know, help um, in, in harsh, harsh environments. So um, is that is the idea that this stuff is deployed at the camp and then it's useful for people at the camp or is there sort of the forward operating base concept that says that there's a hurricane, you know, somewhere else other than Camp Mabry that um, that this can help them respond? Yeah, so I think I think it solves the the reference architecture that could be deployed in theater and in um, all across the, the nation. But its its um, core purpose right now is to work with um, you know key vendors that really understand the importance of edge and have solutions that can actually be validated and 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 demonstrated to city mayors and governors and state DOT leaders. So one one of the so, challenges of creating a lab for this kind of environment, Joe, is that you need a broad swath of real estate to do this. I can't do yeah. this, you know, in my garage and I can't, like I did, you know, in the third internet, I can't do this, you know, in a little makeshift lab at the office or a data center. I, I actually need a community to test this around. Yeah. Um, and while I think it would be fascinating to watch a live uh, a test of this in a real metropolitan area, I wouldn't advise it, right? So you need <laughs> these kinds of partnerships where, yeah. where we can go be scientists and our collaborators yeah. and, and, uh, and partners can test and build and design at, at an accelerated pace, you know, with a, with a um, you know, a, a, a microcosm, if you will, of a broader deployment at your fingertips. Okay, so it's, it's kind of, uh, it's not just that you're worried about, uh, say, vehicle collision um, or uh, security at the base, it's a lab slash test bed for mm -hmm. uh, future development. So now, will will yeah will can't maybe uh, benefit from the solutions that are developed there absolutely one hundred percent. You know, as these solutions unfold, I guess I'd love to hear from each of you what you see uh, coming in the future, and kind of maybe what are the challenges that you've all experienced? You know, both in terms of your own product and service portfolios, as well as all working together. Like, you know, what has been unexpectedly thorny, uh, what has been unexpectedly easy, and, uh, you know, what do we see out five years, 10 years, 15 years as far as trends in either the base technology, like, you know, 5G going to 6G, or, um, you know, how does, how does it all work and how is it evolving, basically? Let's, let's dig in a little bit. Well, the one thing I'd, I'd, I'd highlight is I, I think... Um, what we've experienced in working with so many cities and state and the federal is the realization that we've not experienced this type of build out in our lifetime. I mean, when we're talking about edge and, and new infrastructure showing up on the sidewalk that, that makes our cities more resilient and protects people more effectively and, and provides all these incredible services we wanna see is the interstate highway of 1956 was the last national build out. 
I mean, and now the reality is, is this new build out is going to occur. And in a lot of ways, it's going to be, it's going to be drawn by machine to machine applications first versus it being something that is necessarily, it's, it's not necessarily about 5G being out there. It's about how can the, the enabling technologies that allow machines or like shuttles um, across the city or rovers um, providing, you know, applications or some of the, you know, health applications that you were talking about earlier to be in the city. And it's, it's um, providing functionality that is really machine to machine oriented versus machine to, or computer to human oriented. But I would assume that there's still, you know, human to uh, machine applications. I mean, 100%. one of the big things we learned during the pandemic was, uh, you know, as students learned from home and people yeah. worked from home was the whole digital divide issue, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, cool. you know, simply having connectivity, <laughs> forgetting yeah. about smart vehicles, just having a smart five-year-old requires, uh, yep. you know, some degree of local connectivity. So, so yeah, um, yeah, those those are critical. It was I was shocked, Joe, to, to just in, in you know in my home county, Wake County here in North Carolina, I was I was shocked to learn about just how many students, um, you know, don't have effective internet access uh, to do school. I mean, I I think you know I think like that to me. Maybe I just take it for granted because I'm in the space and it's just you know tech is is life, I guess, right? For for somebody like me, and I, and I take that for granted. But to me, the idea that students don't have access to broadband at home is as a silly a notion as somebody doing their homework by candlelight while everyone else around you is electrified yeah. right i mean it is it's a ridiculous notion i can i couldn't believe the numbers the the digital divide challenge is one of the one of the greatest ambitions i believe of the autonomy institute and why we're so excited about this coalition because it's it, you know in in my experience it's the greatest aggregation of uh like-minded individuals, companies, public and private uh, sector organizations that are coming together around the infrastructure build out. You know, we, you know, we at EdgeX, I mean, we're just, we're down in the weeds trying to make things work for them. Like doing like, you know, the really, the really um, uh, nitty gritty technical stuff about how do you, how do you make all of this infrastructure and sensor data inherently multi-tenant? How do you move from a world of writing static data to a network to streaming uh, thousands of, of flows of information from thousands and thousands of sensors. These are like the, the needy, really down in the weeds problems that are that are unfolding and being worked on as we speak. But the big picture here, you know, really, I think captures around, you know, the digital divide, which is which is a, yep. you know, it's, it's a big deal. It's a big thing. Speaking of the big picture and the fact that um, the national highway system was maybe the last national infrastructure plan, I think we now have a new last most recent infrastructure plan. Um, does that 1.2 trillion at all, you know, impact anything? Is that going to accelerate these kinds of deployments or? Yes. No impact? In, in fact, there's, there's over uh, $200 billion that's attributed to this type of technology um, being deployed at the edge and whether it be making our electric grid more resilient or providing broadband, um, to to completely eliminate the digital divide across the United States, um, a lot of that those funds are going to be applied to to those um, applications. So, yeah. oh, sorry, someone was going to jump in. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, Joe, this is Mike Helfrich. I mean, I, yeah. I we're, we're seeing it already. We've been doing some smart cities work for about the last year. And what originally CARES Act funding was really about enhancing public safety, it, it kind of flipped over the mm -hmm. last six months into digital inclusion as the primary yeah. driver. And we're seeing that. I think the hole that we're starting to see is, yes, we can, we can move that compute to the edge. We can uh, distribute the communications so that traffic stays local to a specific district in a city or a town. Um, the one thing we're finding, though, is that um, a, a lot of the thought around multi-axis edge compute is how do I get up an AWS private VM on that, right? Mm -hmm. What we're actually hearing is, um, and I think Jeffrey said it really well, we've got machines, we've got services. The, the, the bigger issue we're starting to see now is um, how do we put those microservices, those edge-based microservices on top of those geographically distributed infrastructure mm -hmm. in the form of, of the pin. And I think more importantly, what we're seeing now is how do, how do we allow these kids, how do we allow first responders to discover these services? Mm -hmm. So we're doing a great job of putting operating systems out at the edge and communications, but it's a layer right above it that's going to drive the value of the first responder, that student who's yeah. working from home.
you know, in terms of national infrastructure, the obvious question is, uh, and maybe things have changed in the past few days, um, but how do we compare to, you know, say Europe or countries in Asia? So China obviously has a lot going on in terms of deployments for smart cities. Um, South Korea has a lot. Japan has a lot. You know, the European Union is doing a variety of things. Um, you know, I'm sure Singapore, you know, Dubai, pick your favorite country. Mm -hmm. um, but where are we? Are we, you know, leading? Are we, you know, in second place? Are we, you know, tripped and fallen like and can't get up? Help, help I can't get up. <laughs> where, where do we stand? Yeah, you're going to say, Matt? Well, yeah. you know, I think it's interesting. You know, we, we, we tend to think that China is way ahead of us. And, and I think that is true maybe in a, in a technology aspect, but I think it's because they have a, a burning need to do that. Um, they're looking at moving almost 80% of their population to uh, metropolitan areas, right? So um, I think they rank right now like in the 60s from an urbanization score perspective. We're like number 35 or 6. Um, I think the trend for like I said, a lot of those countries is to move the infrastructure and everything into those metropolitan areas versus, you know, you look at uh, like, like John and I live in uh, Wake County here in, in North Carolina. There's actually a trend to move away from the cities into more suburban areas, right? And more rural where I live, there's, I call it the communication deserts, right? I'm lucky I'm on the internet right now. I drive, you know, half mile down the road, I lose cell phone connectivity. Um, so, uh, you know, I think where some of the technologies like 5G are definitely going to benefit those dense urban environments where there's, you know, thousands or millions of users that can't access a traditional infrastructure. Um, we also have to look at hybrid solutions that extend to these rural areas, having, you know, long range point to point links to extend up a, a pin that could be in my neighborhood and service, you know, a small, uh, you know, development um, so it's, it's, it's really interesting how that would go, but I'd say we're, we are maybe behind in the rollout of some of these newer technologies, but we also do quite well with some of the older ones that we have. What I think that the, the biggest thing I'm, you know, like to highlight is like, you know, we have uh, just 30,000 5G nodes versus the almost 1.1 million in China. And, and we're looking at it wrong. I mean, from the standpoint is, because uh, I agree from a standpoint of, of the ability for people to have wireless connectivity, um, we're, we're pretty well covered. But what is that connectivity? That's like maybe three down or maybe if you're lucky, you know, 25 down in some of these, these regions. And they're not looking at what China is looking at, which is they're enabling a network that allows construction vehicles and VTOLs and drones and rovers to basically, in effect, respond and, and build their their cities around them and we keep on looking at it from how fast can we download netflix and how quickly can we get access to the network and it just it's just the wrong thinking and the other catastrophic thing that happened over the last 10 years is we let go of all communication um technology we you know nokia and ericsson all these companies are are no we do not have a major player in the 5g um, sector in the united states anymore I, I would say so. I'm not, I'm not. I'm not really qualified to comment much about about the the warfare between that had the digital warfare that happens between you know countries and what have you. But this is what I would say. I would as, as we look at this macro picture of us versus China versus Middle East versus wherever. Um, you know, I think we can all agree that the formation of economies is is um, is a, is a is a critical element in the wealth of nations, and the wealth of nations really ultimately creates the center of gravity and the concentration of power. I mean, where we are sitting mm -hmm. in the United States is a product of massive infrastructure build out and the ownership of economies. Mm -hmm. That's what made it, that's what made this country. And mm -hmm. so, as we look forward to the future, this is what other countries, I think, really truly appreciate about the future is that. In, you know, in the fourth generation of the internet, the concentration of the kind of infrastructure that's necessary to own the internet economy is what's going to shift the balance of power in the world. So unless we are okay with having the concentration of economic power shift to other places around the world, we must get very serious about the digital infrastructure build out that's necessary for this part of the world to uh, maintain its status amongst the wealth of nations. Yeah, the I mean the the general rule that there's such a multiplier on infrastructure investments, right? Where you know if you just put a little money into a, a physical highway and paving it, um, then you get 
you know, the shipment of goods across that and people going into work and, you know, tourists and things like that. And so your argument is pretty straightforward, right? If the global economy is digital, you better have a compelling digital right. infrastructure to make that all work. Well, so um, if I could just go back to something you said, Matt, about how horrible your, your wireless coverage is. Um, and I'm picturing that Jeff starts deploying pins in your neighborhood now because he feels sorry for you. How like does that actually all work where hypothetically you have, you know, an AT&T or a Verizon phone and Jeff deploys a pin? What is like, wouldn't that be AT&T that we need to deploy the pin or what is that? How does that actually work with multiple different service providers leveraging a shared edge infrastructure? Well, I'll kind of I'll jump in like we're working with actual um, real estate developers that would be installing pins inside neighborhoods. And we're um, working with um, state DOTs that would deploy pins down to highways and cities that would deploy pins across the entire city, not just in the cherry picked areas. But once those pins are there, um, the carriers or the cloud compute or other providers basically then move in with their services. So if, if a pin is deployed in, in that region, and AT&T decides to deploy, now they're gonna have better service um, to those residents. And let's just say there's not a, a backhaul, let's just say there's not fiber. Well, now there's quite a few different ways that the backhaul can be um, addressed, which Matt highlights the kind of point to point, like um, um, one of their companies, Nubatronics, has a point to paint point that is a 20 gigabit connection at a very large distance. Or you can also put a Starlink antenna actually on the pin to be the back hall, front hall to that location, yet all the services are just provided via Wi-Fi or 4G, 5G. So, so if there's a pin in North Carolina, I don't have to get a wireless account with North Carolina state telephone. I can use my no. existing exactly. stuff, whether it's, you know, GM yeah. OnStar or, uh, or my own cell phone or what have you. Yeah, I'd say the answer is is yes, but I would say that um, part of the um, the Autonomy Institute has been working with um, multiple the the federal agencies and the the OEMs that care about a machine and machine network, a network designed specifically for enabling tractors in the field and resilient connectivity for you know cars, trucks, drones, urban air. So I think there'll be a new network as well. But the, the first thing it's going to do is provide incredible resilience to the network providers out there today. Before we get into audience Q&A, I guess the question would be, is there anything else brilliant and compelling that any of you want to get off your chest um, that I wasn't smart enough to ask a cool question about? Um, I think the, the the thing that I, is going back to this this huge build out. I think what's exciting about this opportunity is is the public private partnerships that this is going to instantiate something that really brings communities to the table, cities to the table uh, to to be you know handhold um, the inclusion of this technology to the benefit um, that they want to see. So it's not going to be forced down by industry. It's going to be a collaborative. Um, you know, deployment uh, with both parties at the table. So do you see that the build out basically going city by city? Is that like the right unit or organization by organization? Like, I don't know if it's a manufacturer that has 20 plants, you know, how does, how does again, I'm, I'm just mm -hmm. fascinated by how does all this stuff get from sort of concept to, you know, it's nobody even thinks about it anymore because it's ubiquitous and simple to use. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be private businesses are going to be you know probably leading like uh, real estate developers can lead because they have um, you know full control, but I think it's going to be city by city, it's going to be corridor by corridor, and our goal is by 2023 working with the federal um, legislators, um, launch a full 50 states build out, and um, that's exactly how the 1936 um, Electrification Act happened. It's it basically started in pockets, it was proved out, it was validated, and then everybody wanted it. And then um, and a, a federal act was put together. Hmm. All right, well, uh, if anyone has any questions, kind of the, uh, 
there was a question um, about public-private partnerships, which is uh, is funny because uh, as I was starting to read it, you were you were answering it. I don't know if you if you saw it or not. So, um, but while we're waiting for any other questions, um, maybe we can start wrapping up with summary remarks. So, uh, Mike, you want to jump in with kind of what you see? Are you uh, optimistic? How does this all look? Yeah, we're 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 very bullish on on just whether you call it 5G or CBRS mm -hmm. or high speed communications or edge compute. We're very bullish on it. We're seeing it. The the public private partnership. We've been involved in two of them to date. Canton, Ohio, the NFL, and the city of Canton, specific to Centennial Park. Purely driven by digital inclusion. Great opportunity. Wish they had what you guys have right now. But but I can tell you, we're also seeing this in in other cities. Uh, certainly in Detroit, the automotive manufacturers looking at digital inclusion, partnering with the city to uh, to deliver that to folks. Um, it, I think it's going to be a very exciting time, especially as this infrastructure bill kicks in place. Great. Very cool. Um, so before I move on to you, Matt, um, somebody said, uh, talk to us about what the Alpha Lab looks like and who can participate. I'll, 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 you know, I'll summarize because I mean, I'll kind of cover that, but you okay. know, what I, you know, I mean, I'll, you know, look, this is what it comes down to. As I said earlier, this is not a small challenge. This is not, um, you know, a one company deal, one company solution kind of, uh, kind of opportunity for everybody to participate in. This is going to take everybody, uh, you know, kind of rowing in the same direction. And, you know, you know, Jeff points out, you know, historical moments for the U S economy, like the electric electrification of industry, and the build out of the national highways, those, those first mover positions that we established in this country is what, gave, is what gives us everything that we have today as an economy, as a society, as a leader in the world, okay? And we're at the cusp of this next phase of infrastructure build out. We can't sit back and, and, and rest on what we did in the past. It's going to take another significant collective infrastructure build out for us to maintain a level of prosperity that we're used to in this country. And to that end, the, the idea of the internet, internet military things and the Alpha Lab at Camp Mabry is intended to be a, a, a somewhat open forum, not open to anybody just walking off the street, but come collaborate with us. If you have a solution or if you have an idea or you have a technology or you have some code yeah. uh, that you wanna test and, and contribute to the, the evolution of all of this, um, that, that forum is wide open. That's how you participate. Um, get in touch, reach out, yeah. uh, hit any one of us, you know, Cubic, Autonomy Institute, EdgeX, Blue Force. Yeah. I will help facilitate this because we're all on the same team here. This isn't yeah. about us versus anybody else in the industry. This is about, you know, our, our corner of the world leading the way to the next generation of the internet. And the, the and the, the what's good about the Alpha Lab is it's going to simulate um, and allow you to um, to, to um, have uh, applications um, like you're in a dense urban environment. So the ability to to test and and demonstrate things like you know crowd crowd counting and um, allowing rovers to routinely deliver things, or even one of the applications that was early on is. With just autonomous lawnmowers, just maintaining the campus to be completely the most maintained, you know, um, military base in in the country. So it is all those things um, kind of just add up to uh, the, the demonstrations the, of the the hardware itself. Yeah, so we're really just on the cusp of basically the next big wave is the way yeah. to look at it, right? It's you know as we move to you know IoT, not just like a, a, a little uh, smoke detector. Um, sitting in a factory, but all of these interacting, intelligent, aware uh, yep. robots. So um, we have a question about, uh, that, and this is perfect, Matt, because you can do a summary uh, and comments as, uh, as we answer this question, which is um, where you see military applications for the IOMT being prioritized. Is it um, actual battlefield applications or more like just, you know, op, not just to say just, but logistics. So I, I think it's the fusion of everything, right? Um, and so, you know, Cubic, we live the edge. Uh, we've been doing it for decades, um, you know, all the way down to the last soldier on the battlefield, whether and all the way on a vehicle or a talk. Um, I think it's a fusion of logistics, right? So operations and logistics go hand in hand. When it's, We need to know that the, you know, the hopper on a 50 cal machine gun is getting low on ammunition and they need a resupply, we want to predict that before they get down to the last bullet. 
um, and then get that you know additional ammunition supplies whatever it may be forward to a unit uh, to utilize rapidly rather than have to wait for something to come in. Um, same thing with vehicular maintenance, right? Being predictive uh, before the vehicle leaves the fob or while it's out, trying to look at what's going on in the vehicle, you know, operating temperatures, um, you know, mileage, all those things to say, hey, this vehicle is going to go down in a, you know, in the next 36 hours. Uh, we should probably take that offline and use a different one. Um, and then intelligence too, right? Um, looking at the multi-domain operations, uh, sensor applications, cyber intrusion, all those things, you know, we, we kind of live day by day. So it really is truly a fusion of everything that we could possibly use in the military down to, you know, beans, bullets, and, and soldiers, you know, their, their status and health on the battlefield, um, you know, when they're injured, how to get that information back to a emergency trauma center. So, they can be ready for that, the reception of that patient rather than having to rely on voice communications. Um, so we're really trying to pull all those things together at Cubic on the platforms that we make and with partners like Blue Force and EdgeX, right, to, to try to utilize their applications and their software to, to make it enable our product. So. Yeah, as you're talking, I was thinking actually not so much of military applications, but very similar applications, which is uh, aircraft maintenance, right? So you've got, you know, uh, 30 or 40 IoT sensors on a jet engine, each of which collects thousands of data points per second, uh, and you end up with multiple terabytes per hour of flight, and then you, you grab that data, you use it to do predictive analytics, and that lets you, you know, optimize um, the, you know, where you actually, where and when you do the maintenance, so it's actually at a maintenance facility rather than, you know, out on a desert island somewhere. Um, exactly. So yeah, like, it, I, it, should, it's kind of the same thing thank, over. Sorry, we should, we should take a minute to thank Jeff for allowing us to test the 50 cal ammunition reload in his backyard. <laughs> yeah. uh, that, that application works, great. Jeff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Did, did you settle good. with your neighbor, by the way, about the last? <laughs> <week>? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, on that positive and uplifting note, yeah. I think uh, we're just about out of time. So I'll just say, on behalf of all the panelists, um, thank you all for joining. Um, it was uh, fun, informative, um, and for everyone except for Jeff's neighbor, it, it's been a great discussion. <laughs> so, thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks, Joe.